proud to be part of Gallup uh, core team and I feel super delighted to present and welcome you here today. Uh, so basically a little bit about Gallup. So Gallup has been created in August 2020. So we are still a very young society, but be ready that we have a very interesting things coming up. So stay tuned. Uh, we basically about our mission and our aim. So we aim at raising awareness around women's rights and gender equality. Uh, as you may have seen and noticed, uh, since its creation, Gallup has been actively working at empowering women and sharing inspiring stories um, with you through our blog or our social medias, especially Instagram. Um, so it's only the beginning, as I just mentioned. So really stay tuned because some great things are coming up. Uh, so also at Gallup, we truly believe in the power of sharing, discussing and learning. And that is for these exact reasons uh, why we are here today. We want to learn more about female genital cutting or FGC. Actually, FGC is not a very much talked about topic, but it is very actual as you will be able to notice and see throughout this event. So I would like to give a very thank you um, to Sahio for being here today and providing us the opportunity to learn more about this uh, very actual issue, as I just mentioned. And now enough of me talking, and I'm gonna leave the floor to Sahiyo for the presentation and talk. Thank you so much, Maud, and to Girl SCP for having us here today. Um, my name is Laura Kingstone. I'm the Communications Manager for SEO US, and I'm joined today by Kate Cox, who is the program's intern. Um, so I'm gonna start sharing screen so we can get into this presentation. Mm -hmm. Okay. So welcome everybody. Um, to begin with, uh, we're here today to talk about, as Maud said, female genital cutting, also known as FGC. Um, so before we even get into things, if you could all go ahead in the chat box to ask and to ask yourselves, how, do you, how did you become aware of FGC and what do you know about the practice? Um, there's no pressure at all to be super familiar with this. We're just asking to try to get a bit of an idea of where everyone's coming from. Uh, later in this presentation, we'll stop and start looking through the answers. Um, so to continue, um, thank you. Sorry, Laura, yes. uh, we actually, your screen isn't on widescreen. It's showing the speaker notes. Oh, my apologies. Um, let me, sorry about that. Um, I think you have to click resume or something. Resume, okay. Um, sorry, everyone. I think, oh, you know what? I think I got it. Uh, okay, this should be it. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, is the presentation visible now? Yeah, okay. Okay, <laughs> starting over. So, say our, say, who are we? What do we do? What is this all about? As you can see here, Seyo began as a conversation between five women who all felt really strongly about the ritual of female genital cutting, also known as katna in the Bora community. So as you can see, Seyo starts as five women, and this collaboration grew between what we now know as the five co-founders. They realized they had a need for an organized and informed forum within the community that could help drive a movement to end katna. So Seyo was born and the organization uses all kinds of tools like dialogue, education, collaborating with communities. At Seyo, we also know that sharing stories can be empowering and cathartic, and this can move people to do really great things. So one of Seyo's programs is a storytelling platform, which can allow women and girls to speak up for the first time about a taboo topic. Seyo's website, for instance, serves as a space for women to share their experiences of FGC either anonymously or with their names, whatever they're comfortable with. Reading these stories can help break that feeling of isolation that survivors often feel about their feelings and experiences, and it can inspire others to speak out. So we'd like to welcome today Maria Taher, who is here on this meeting. Um, she is one of Seo's co-founders and also the US Executive Director. Uh, you'll have a chance later in the presentation to ask any questions directly to her. Thank you for being here, Maria. Um, so, a, so a little bit about the programs that Seo runs. 
Um, as you can see here, things really vary from storytelling, webinars, all these different things from education to community. Um, and next, what we're going to do is play one of the videos from this Voices project. As you can see, SEO gives people the space to share their experience in their own terms and their own words in a field where survivors are often spoken for. I'm a Samburu from Northern Kenya, the last born girl in a polygamous family. When I was eight, I started boarding school with Catholic nuns. My dad was angry with my mom for allowing me to go to school, but she supported me. Just before my 13th birthday, I went back to my village during the Christmas holiday. One morning, my mother woke me up and said, you have to be strong. It is your day to become a woman and not be dirty anymore. You have to face everything that women face because I have also faced it. I was led outside our muddy hut where a smoky fire burned. My clothes were removed and cold water mixed with milk was poured over me while my arms and legs were held, I was cut several times with a razor blade. My sister stood next to me, holding a stick and said, don't cry, you will bring shame to our mother. I kept quiet to avoid being beaten. I heard a woman say, make sure that it's all cut out. Then I passed out. When I woke up, my whole body hurt. I thought about how I'd been naked in front of all those women and I did not want to see anyone. Why would our ancestors pass this act down to us? I could not accept it. But others do. Women keep it going. And men never ask about what our girls go through. They only say, this is what is supposed to happen. When I speak out to educate young girls that they can refuse to be cut, many people say, why are you crushing our traditions? But no one has ever convinced me that the pain of female gender mutilation is justified in the name of culture or anything else. If I ever have a daughter, she will never go through what I want. I hope my story will inspire other survivors to step up and help young girls to say no to their GM. So that video was from Severina Lamachakoti, who is a survivor and an activist. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so we're gonna dig in a little bit more to what is FGC. Now, female genital cutting is the term that Seo and many others use, but it's also referred to as FGM, or female genital mutilation, as well as other colloquial terms in different local languages where it's practiced. This includes Katna in the Bora community, as well as Suna and Bondo in other communities. So Seyo is recognized internationally as a human rights violation. It's acknowledged that it is torture and an extreme version of violence against women and girls. It is usually performed between birth and puberty. Now, according to the WHO, the World Health Organization, FGC is classified into four major categories, and these are based on the type and extent of the cut. So we're going to review these four categories now, but we should be mindful that these categories are very broad. They're just divided to help us understand a bit better. So type one is excision or removal of the clitoral hood with or without part of all of the clitoris. Type two is partial or total removal of the clitoris and the labia minora with or without excision of the labia majora. Type three is narrowing of the vaginal orifice with creation of a covered seal 
by cutting and apositioning the labia minora and or the labia majora with or without excision of the clitoris, known as infibulation. Type 4 is a catch-all phrase for other types of FGC, including pricking, piercing, or cauterizing. Now, these categories range on a scale from least severe, type 1, to most severe, type 3. Type 4, as we said, is a type of other category. But because FGC is not a standardized medical practice, these are very broad categories, and the severity and trauma related to cuts vary deeply between women. Some women might be traumatized and have severe physical impacts. Others might have no impacts that they can see. So FGC is a form of gender-based violence. And that's a phrase that is referring to an umbrella that includes childhood marriage, rape, domestic assaults, honor crimes, domestic violence, and other crimes against women. While FGC is a specific type of gender-based violence, or GBV, GBV occurs everywhere and takes many different forms. That is to say that FGC is not the end-all be-all of gender-based violence. Communities that do not practice FGC are not automatically free from GBV, and all communities have work to do to end violence against women. So during this current situation of COVID, we've seen some impacts on FGC and GBV. So given what we know, COVID-19 has been likely to compound existing gender inequalities and increase gender-based violence. One of the key tools to fight FGMC is the classroom, but with many schools closed worldwide, girls are everywhere more vulnerable to FGMC. According to the UN, COVID-19 will leave an additional 2 million women and girls vulnerable to FGC. Now moving towards, towards healing from FGC is often really complicated by a lack of adequate resources. At SEO, we try to at least create a safe space so survivors can share their stories and begin to heal that way. So we're going to show another video from the Voices Project. When I turned 40, I felt brave enough to seek counseling. It took me a long time to be ready to deal with the grief and trauma of FGM and the guilt I experienced after speaking up about it and exposing my family and culture's dirty secret. Once I began counseling, I wanted to know firsthand what was done to me and if it would explain why I was childless. Up to that point, all the medical professionals I had seen for various reasons over the years had completely ignored my FGM during examinations. This time, I got an appointment with a female FGM specialist. I told her my FGM was done in a medical setting when I was seven years old. After examining me, the doctor said that what happened to me had nothing to do with whether or not I could get pregnant. Then she said, women's vaginas and clitorises come in different shapes and forms. Every woman's body is different. I can't see any visible scarring. You could have been born this way with no visible clitoris. Looking back now, I think she meant to be kind and put my mind at ease. But her words that meant to offer comfort only caused more suffering. I had wanted a doctor's validation, an acknowledgement that the FGM was real and not something only in my mind. Instead, her failure to listen to what I had told her about being cut and her focus on the lack of physical evidence just emphasized the pain. I'm lucky I was mutilated in a way that left no scarring, but FGM is about more than bodily harm. After a year of counseling, I've got some closure and perspective, and yet nothing will erase the sense of loss I feel at what was done to me without my consent.
So we thank Tasneem Perry for sharing her story. Oops, excuse me. We're going to show another story, another video as well. And this is from Layla, who is an activist. And here she is speaking at the Oslo Freedom Forum. FGM fundamentally, it's one of the worst forms of child abuse, is a form of sexual abuse. I also would add by saying it's one of the worst forms of sexual assaults. Just picture this, a child in this room, we we'll bring them on stage, we we'll pin them on this floor, spread their legs apart, just touching their genitals, you have committed many crimes. So the cutting comes afterwards. So for me, when I came, when I got involved in this work, I realized everybody was tiptoeing around this subject. I said, no. So the narrative of my work was we need to change the language that we use when we talk about FGM. This is about oppressing women. It's about oppressing women's bodies. It's about controlling women's sexuality. And that's a global issue. That's not an African issue. That is not an Asian issue. That's a global issue. So as you can see from what Layla says, um, she's speaking towards this claim that maybe it's an issue that only happens in some places, maybe it's not for everybody to care about. FGM but we see here that it in fact is a global issue and something for everyone to pay note of. So some of the reasons that FGC happens is from justifications. Basically, it's considered a social norm within communities and it gets justified in all kinds of ways so that it can continue from generation to generation. So we see here on this slide some of the different reasons given for its continuation in many communities. These range from tradition to the idea of cleanliness or purity or the aiding of religious piety. Some say it might enhance the sexual pleasure. But one important note to make is that the reasons FGC is performed can also shift over time in a community. For example, for many years within the Bora community, one of the central ideas of why FGC was performed was this idea that women were not supposed to be sexual. However, now many religious authorities from the Bora community tend to promote the idea that FGC is a religious requirement over the idea that women are not supposed to be sexual. Regardless of the reason given, it's important to remember this is just a social norm. All communities have social norms, such as wearing a mask during COVID-19. However, there are also harmful social norms. That's like child marriages, certain religious denominations not allowing forms of medical care. We even see this in an example in Idaho where a religious sect uh, allowed their child to die because they were refusing medical help. So we're going to see here some other videos from the Voices Project. This one from Aisha Youssef. When I was five, my grandma took me to see a lady. They pulled a curtain close, made me lay down, and then cut me. My dad didn't want it done to me, so my grandma did it when he was out of town. He was mad later, and my two youngest sisters have not been cut. Years, I made fun of girls who hadn't had it done. We couldn't to hit. We thought we were better than they were. Our whole family moved to the States. And when I was about 12 to 13 years, I overheard my mom and my auntie arguing. My auntie wanted to have her daughter cut, even though she herself had needed to be cut open again to have sex. And then wasn't able to have a vaginal birth. I heard my mom tell my auntie, you don't need to do it. Look at my two daughters. They're fine. I had to confront my mom. Why was she sick enough for my cousin when she hadn't for me? She told me she had felt bad about letting my grandma and my great grandma take me that day. She said, yes, I allowed it, but I made sure it was the sunnah, the least harmful kind. Digging deeper, I learned it's not a religious practice. It's a cultural thing that's passed down. There's nothing in the Quran about it, but aunties and grandmothers do it. If you hadn't had it done, you're considered promiscuous. Men ask you, if you're not, they get turned off. At least the newer generation is talking more openly about it. 
I thought it was normal for a long time, but I think differently now. Hope oh, my story will end the woeful ignorance on the issue of FGC. So thank you to Aisha for sharing her story. The next video is from Lena Kandawala. It's 1980. I'm seven years old on summer vacation in Karachi, Pakistan. One morning, my aunt comes to take me shopping. I'm excited. We head to Sadar and stop at an unfamiliar apartment building. My aunt says, I just have to run an errand. I follow her into a dark entrance up two flights of stairs. We pause outside a badly scratched door and my aunt rings the bell. An elderly woman greets us. She's dressed in a ghagra koti and her head is covered with a dupatta. The apartment is cramped and hot, musty. The woman leads us into a brightly painted room. Suddenly and without any warning, she grabs me and pushes me onto my back. She strips off my panties and spread eagles me with well-practiced efficiency. Before I know what's happening, I feel a sharp, hot pain between my legs. As I cry out, she says triumphantly, done. She quickly bundles me into a cloth diaper and brings me to my feet. Only then do I notice a pair of old scissors with blood on them, on a tray next to her. I hear my aunt say, Auntie ne salam karo? I obey. The whole thing takes less than 15 minutes. I'm filled with shame. My mom had caught me exploring my body a few weeks before. This is a sin, she'd said. So I believe I have been punished. Over the years, I've wondered, would I have grown up more confident if I'd never been cut? Would I have been better able to appreciate and enjoy my body or been more comfortable with sex and intimacy? I will never know. I think back to that salam and my blood boils. I hope my story will break the circle of silence that has allowed genital cutting to continue. The next video that we're going to look at is, um, actually, excuse me, the next slide, the next thing we're gonna talk about is the mental and physical impacts of FGC. So contrary to claims, FGM and FGC do not have any health benefits for girls or women. FGM and FGC can cause serious bleeding and problems urinating, as well as later cysts, infections, and complications in childbirth, and potential or increased risk of newborn death. The impact from FGMC varies according to person. So while some folks might experience none of these effects, others might experience multiple. Some proponents of FGC say that what they experienced wasn't a traumatic experience. Therefore, no one has a traumatic experience. But as we've learned, there is no one experience of FGC. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Kate, my wonderful colleague, who's gonna talk a bit about um, common misconceptions. Thank you so much, Laura, um, for that wonderful uh, segment. Um, so I was just going through the group chat um, to kind of see um, how you guys have learned about FGC in the past. Um, and someone spoke about learning about FGC from a friend studying human rights as well as in school. Um, and many times when people first learn about FGC, it comes with certain misconceptions about the practice. Um, listed on the screen are a few of the most common misconceptions surrounding the practice of FGC that we have noticed. Um, they include Islamophobia um, or Islamophobic notions that FGC only happens in Muslim communities, despite the fact that FGC has no religion. Um, another common misconception is falsely thinking that this practice only happens in Africa or within African communities and countries, despite the fact that it is documented to occur in 92 countries um, and 63 countries outside of the continent of Africa. 
And finally, for those of us living in Europe in the US, there's a common misconception that FGC is something that doesn't happen here or that we don't need to be concerned about, which takes us to our next segment. If you can change the slide, Laura. FGC is a global phenomenon. Yep, and you can go to the next slide as well. According to the World Health Organization, around 3 million women and girls are at risk of undergoing female genital cutting every year, and at least 200 million women and girls across 92 countries have been subjected to FGC globally. Next slide. Um, this graphic shows you all the countries where FGC has been documented to occur. In total, 92 countries document FGC occurring within their borders. Um, some believe this graph may even underestimate the number of countries where FGC happens as there is not enough research done in all countries. As you can see, FGC is a global issue that isn't limited to one geographic area. Um, now we'll watch a quick video um, made by FGC Survivor and Voices to End FGC participant Renee Bergstrom. family. We were close to the earth and our animals. When I was three, my mother became concerned that my face turned red when I touched my clitoris. She brought me to a doctor and the doctor cut me. My mother said, don't ever talk about this. I was alone with my questions as a child, teenager, and young adult. I did not discuss nerve damage discomfort, even with my sisters. When I gave birth to my first child, I did not talk about the complications I faced. I wanted a natural labor, but the doctor didn't know what to do. He put me under to perform an extensive episiotomy. I awoke four hours after my daughter was born, and it took my body months to heal. I told a couple from my church about what had happened to me as a child. They said, don't ever tell that story again. Later, I shared with women at work who said, don't repeat that or you'll ruin your career. But is this really my shame? What about other women having their babies with doctors who don't know what to do? I could not stay silent, and I started reaching out to new people. My Somali friend, Filsan Ali, and I produced a bilingual brochure for infibulated Somali women to give to their doctors to make safe labor and delivery plans. I went public internationally, and my close friends and family supported me. Creating art and connecting with nature has helped me heal. I've learned to spin wool and weave on a loom. I have found peace in flower gardens, weeding, deadheading, and making bouquets. Today I live where eagles soar and deer feed by a river. I hope my story will help people be aware that girls have been cut in cultures throughout the world. Yeah, I just want to thank Renee so much for sharing her story. Um, and as it was explained, FGC is really a global issue that affects people everywhere, and there is no one universal place or person who is affected by FGC. Um, for example, there are currently 600,000 women and girls living with the effects of FGC in Europe. Um, this graphic on the screen right here shows you the number um, of people who are survivors of FGC living across Europe. Um, in France, for example, there are 125,000 women and girls living with the effects of FGC. Um, next slide. Additionally, there are over 180,000 girls living in Europe who are at risk of undergoing FGC. Next slide. And this graphic right here shows you the percent of girls who are, percentage of girls who are vulnerable to FGC across Europe. 
In France, for example, 12 to 21% of girls are at risk of undergoing FGC. In some places, it is as high as 25% or one out of every four girls who is at risk of undergoing FGC. Um, so now we wanted to talk a little bit um, about the laws um, and state of FGC in France. And this is an excerpt from an article I found um, that describes how France has no specific laws against FGC, but there have been 29 trials and 100 convictions over the last three decades. Um, following an explosion of media and public rage in the late um, 1970s, the French state began to prosecute parents and cutters under its existing laws against grievous bodily harm and violence against children. France's actions against FGC, however, have not been purely based in law. Um, there have been intensive campaigns of education, um, educating health and teachers, um, being training them around the problem. Um, and additionally, in the health system, girls are systemically examined for signs of FGC during health checks carried out on babies. Um, but there are ways in which the situation in France could be improved. Um, after talking to our friends at Girl Up, um, they explained to us that France is lacking in the implement implementation of specific laws against FGC. And additionally, the campaign of education was not well applied, um, according to their experience having grown up in France. And we also wanted to encourage people to look into the law um, on their own. Uh, we're an organization based in the US, so we don't have 100% knowledge of French law. Um, I really want to encourage you guys um, to look into it in your own and get your own local understanding of what's happening. Um, next slide. So with all the information that we've kind of been um, dumping on you guys, you might be wondering, um, what can we do about it? Uh, next slide. Um, now we're going to watch kind of a short clip um, of an, the end of the excerpt from Leila Hussain's speech. My friend Isa, who's one of the amazing midwives in the country who's also a survivor, she creates these spaces. How a CSA, you know, two decades ago, she protected her daughter from this. So my daughter is not the first one who was protected, except we just didn't share these positive stories. We like to share the negative. Yes, we need to share the negative, but in order for us to have any solutions, we need to know there is hope out there. The girl in the middle, I don't want to get too emotional, she's my sister. Um, she's the one who was, uh, sorry. <sighs> I named my daughter after my sister Feirouz. I still have nightmares about that scream, but my sister's raising two boys. And working with men is so important because we were cut for men. So men need to speak out. You have to speak out because you are the fathers, you are decision makers, you play a key role in this. So my sister's raising two amazing boys, two feminist boys, if I might add. <laughs> feminist boys. So it's important that we tell these stories. And my friend Hibba was on this side. He was another campaign in London, protected her daughters at the forefront. And the reason I like to share these pictures with you is because I think I should have a squad like Taylor Swift does. I'm sorry, if she gets to have one, I should have one too. And it's a way of saying, I don't do this on my own. And let me tell you, I have more pictures, but I just don't have time to show it to you today. But it's by saying, there's a team behind me. So my action to all of you is, is we need to start protecting our daughters from harm. We need to invest in our girls. Our daughters don't need to alter any part of their bodies to be accepted. We don't we need that. So my question to all of you is, are you all gonna be part of this squad that's going to end all forms of harm against women against women and girls, because that's how we're going to end FGM. We have to end all of it. So who's with me on this one? This is my daughter first, my teenager. 
Do you remember the first picture my mum was holding on to me? So this is, I would like to end with this picture, my mother, me holding on to my daughter. We're both two mums who want to make a better world for our children. And my mother chose a different path. But what we celebrate today is the fact that Firuz is not just free from female genital mutilation. She's free from all forms of oppression against women and girls. Thank you. Yeah, so that was just the end of her speech, um, really trying to encourage people to get involved in the issue. Um, and if we can go to the next slide. Isa, who's one of them. Pardon? Here are some of the things um, that we all can be doing in our lives to help encourage the abandonment of FGC. Um, one is education. Um, FGC is a complex issue. And while this conversation is a great start, there's always more to learn um, and to understand to better support survivors and work towards ending all forms of gender-based violence, including FGC. Um, so trying to further your education is always crucial. Um, and second is support. There are a lot of organizations working in Europe and across the world working to end this practice who could use your donations um, and volunteer time and support. And finally, action. Um, if you see gaps in the law or in people's perceptions, um, stand up. Your voice can have an impact in the abandonment of FGC and also fighting to end negative stereotypes around this practice. Um, and on the next slide, we have some of the already established organizations working in Europe and France, um, including the Desert Flower Foundation and the Orchid Project. Um, if you are looking for more local advocacy groups, um, go to the European and FGM network. Um, is there kind of an overreaching group that's connecting all of the local advocacy groups together? And we've linked their website in the bottom of this slide if you guys are looking to get involved. Um, and now we want to take some time um, just to kind of answer any questions you have in the last few minutes. Um, and again, we're also joined today by Maria Taher, the co-founder of SEO, um, who will help answer your questions as well. Maybe if we want to stop sharing the screen. Um, there we go. And then if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Um, we want to have kind of like a just a discussion. Um. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Clara. Um, we actually met during a, a meeting. My camera is just not working. Um, first of all, thanks a lot for, uh, for the presentation. It was really like interesting and um, I learned a lot um, again. Do you um, like what is the main thing that things that you achieved things like since Sahio was was created? Like, is there any milestone or anything where you're particularly proud where you really were able to make a difference? Uh, Maria, if you want to take this one, I know there was a recent some law changes that were pretty exciting. And yeah, I'm happy to. That's a great question. So SEO has been around for five years. We were founded in December 2015 and really um, Laura shared a little bit, but it was founded by five women who, who were aware of FGC or female genital cutting happening in the Bora community. And we were all connected to it. And it is a community from or with origins in India, but diasporas all over the world. And at the time we started because there really wasn't a recognition that it was ha happening or occurring in countries and into populations outside of the African context. And so we were pretty, um, pr pretty confident that it was prevalent in the Bora community. And um, we decided one of the first things to do was to conduct a larger scale study to understand the prevalence rate of FGC in the Bora community. So we worked with various NGOs and some academics, and I also have a um, master's in social work degree as well too. So um, I've done research on the issue before. And we put together a study um, in which we were able to get over 400 women to take part who had been raised or born into the Bora community who lived all over the world. And we found that 80% had been cut. So that kind of confirmed for us that it was pretty prevalent. Um, another thing we found though, which was very interesting was that 81% said they did not want it to continue into the next generation. 
And that was something that was very important for us to see because we recognized that, that there was this silence that really was leading to the continuation of FGC um, at many different levels. And one of them was simply on the community level. And that's another reason why SEO does a lot of work on storytelling and why we showed you a lot of voices videos from our project from our project called Voices to End FGMC, because SEO does really believes in the idea of sharing stories and allowing those affected to share their stories so that we are able to take issues that are very typically secretive or not known or considered to be private and put them in the public sphere so that they are recognized and acknowledged and so that we can create change um, amongst them. And since that time, we have learned and we have received um stories and we've received contacts from people in many different countries um all around the world where they were letting us know that fgc happens and so something that started from very basically a website um was to some research to really gathering information that this is something that is pretty prevalent globally uh was it's, it's a huge source of pride i think for sayo in general and really our mission is driven in allowing communities to engage in this topic so just in the past five years seeing how much the public dialogue has emerged on this issue and how many communities are coming forward has been amazing as well as like the stories that we're hearing of change and Layla had mentioned this in her video clip but really understanding that stories of change are happening that people are giving up this practice this learned behavior um, is incredibly important so we share a lot of those stories too so i think that's the biggest achievement that i would talk about for sayo particularly wow amazing amazing it's really really cool thank you I think we have a question in the chat as well. Um, what are some of the things that we can do to get involved and help this issue? I think there are a lot of ways. Um, I think that just on an individual level, um, you know, you can be making sure that uh, people either are aware of this or if they have misconceptions about this. Something we didn't really get into in this presentation but is very much a big deal is a lot of the media on FGC can be really Islamophobic or xenophobic or just be sort of phrased in ways that are disdainful or problematic. Um, so I think kind of educating yourself a little bit about what FGC is and what it is not can be really helpful in uh, you know, putting down misconceptions. Uh, in addition to that, like we mentioned, there are so many different organizations you can get involved with, whether that's volunteering or donating. Um, you know, say we have both volunteer opportunities and internships, um, and we also can connect you to other organizations um, if there are more. And then, yeah, I just want to reiterate what Laura said, like definitely educating yourself. Um, I think that there are easy ways to reach out to organizations, to connect with them, see if you want to volunteer with them, consider donating to them, um, share information, share the stories that we've shared so that others can be educated on this issue as well too. And then there are various um, other ways to do advocacy. So if you're looking to do policy or like find out more about legislation, a lot of groups are doing change.org petitions or they are calling their, their representatives or lawmakers um, to find out if there is anything in the books. So there are, there are many different ways to get involved, um, but an easy way, first step is just to educate yourself more on this issue. I have a question. Um, since like since a long time, I've been following this um, things about F, um, female mutations, uh, genital mutations, and I was wondering when I was back in India, uh, I saw that there was a lot of PILs, but public interest litigations getting filed against it, and governments being said that you know what, we don't have any cases in 2017 and 18, there were no cases reported in India. But in 2019, uh, we did have a lot of cases which came up for those years. So what are the laws that, and what are, how can we help the laws to be built? Like how can we make the laws um, stronger for this as students or maybe people studying law, what could they do to promote this 
and get it out there in the world. If, like, if SAIO is in, the, in India, does it help in India? Or does it help in all of those countries other than the US? Yeah, that's a great question. So SAIO is um, international and we do focus in India and, and in the US as well. Um, my SAIO India counterparts, so the, the five co-founders, uh, I came from the US, but three of them came from India and still do a lot of work in India. In terms of uh, what you're mentioning, so for those who are not aware, India currently does not have any national law on FGMC. Um, and for the past few years, there have been some situations um, happening in the courts. And um, Shreya, you had mentioned a PIL, which is a public interest litigation that was filed a couple years ago um, by somebody who actually did not come from the Bora community, but who was concerned with it happening and been hearing about survivors sharing their stories. And then that right now has actually been referred to, it was being listened in the Supreme Court and a, I think a three bench court, and but it was referred over a year ago now to the full Supreme Court, which I believe is, I can't remember how many members in India, it might be five or more, but there, unfortunately there hasn't been any activity on the Indian federal law or in that case at this point. But you know, your question around like, how can we get involved? I think one thing to do is thinking, looking at how can you raise awareness of this issue in any way. And again, like going back to like sharing stories of survivors is important. If you do have contacts with legal representatives, um, being able to, you know, tell them that this is an issue that you're interested in, or this is an issue that you feel passionate about, looking for those organizations that might be working on the law. So say, oh, um, we're not, we support legislation. Um, there is a group we speak out in India that is doing a lot of work specifically around legislation in India. So they're a great group to reach out to as well. Um, there are other ways, you know, of demanding that certain countries, so India, for I'm just, since you mentioned India, I'm talking about India. India signed on to the, um, uh, why am I blinking on the word? The, 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 it's the, oh gosh, I'm completely blank. It's an international treaty though. Basically it's the, it's, it's not the UN convention. Um, Apologize, I'm completely blanking, but it's it is a international treaty that they have signed on to, which the United States has not ratified yet, um, and it basically holds India accountable to reporting FGMC um, to the international community, and they have not yet done that. And I apologize, I I can it will come back to me probably after this call so we could send information to maybe everybody who's registered about this. But there are things to look at how can you be accountable or you know, encouraging your representatives to, to really like take interest in this issue. Um, it can seem intimidating as a student on what to do. So my first um, suggestion would always be to see if you can connect with those organizations that are working on this. Okay, thank you. I had one question because we were talking about uh, education, which I think is pretty very interesting. Do you actually have uh, people going into schools and going into like uh, introducing this issue to the children and maybe also to parents? I don't know through through any educational or any talk. And do, do you do that with Sahil? That's a great question. So we do do at outreach presentations. Um, usually we're involved. We don't go into schools and that's another area that actually policy can be very important um, and you, it'd be interesting to learn what the policies are in your particular country. So I could, for instance, I can share in the United States. Um, we, the state, there's both federal laws, um, which are national and then there are state laws. And the state laws vary. So in the US, we only have 39 states that have a state law and all the laws are different. So some of them criminalize FGMC, but then some of them make provisions for education and outreach by their local government departments. Virginia um, is a, one, the only state in the US that does this, but they, uh, they passed a law where now it is um, mandated to teach about FGC 
in um, middle school and high school. So from like 12 to onwards. And that's pretty amazing to see that being done at the policy level here. Um, the UK, I believe, does some of that too, but I'm not, I, I don't remember the specific um, legislation in the UK. But it, it's, that's another way policy can be effective. Because I think a lot of people think of policy and they think about criminalization, which is an important piece. But we're also talking about changing social norms, which Laura mentioned earlier on that F GC continues because it's ingrained for a lot of different reasons, whether communities say it's religious or cultural or health and hygiene, which is false, um, it's been justified. And so what you're doing is really thinking about how do you reframe this into an issue that um, shows that it's harmful. Legislation is one piece. So having those laws reaffirm that this is something that is, you know, harmful is important, but so is that community education and outreach. And that's another area policy can be effective in is thinking about when you're creating legislation, how do you make it holistic? So it's addressing all those pieces too. Is that helpful? Yeah, there you Thank you. Okay. I think we have a few more minutes if anyone else has any last questions. Um, I have one last question. It's maybe uh, like a slightly weird question or like hard to respond, but um, in one of the videos, the, the woman, uh, the witness, she um, said that she went to see, uh, I guess a gynecologist or someone and uh, that that person said that it's normal and. Uh, etc. Do you think that a majority of doctors in the Western society would like actually know how to act and how, know how to handle such situations or what do you think? What's your... What's that's a your great feeling? question. It's a very complicated question. So that's another area um, where education is incredibly important too. And um, this is something that also can be done via policy, but also in different ways. But really, how do you educate healthcare professionals to work on this issue. He has actually done a lot more work on this than the U.S. has, but we've been starting to address it in the last few years. And so there has been some federal funding that has come um, from our government to do research um, around really understanding healthcare professionals um, are working with survivors or if they're knowledgeable about this and what kind of tools they need. And SEO does a lot of work around educating in general in the public, but we also do our, a lot of our voices videos um, also are used and shown to train other frontline care professionals like healthcare professionals, like, you know, OBGYNs or with uh, primary care doctors or nurse practitioners. So there's a lot more that needs to be done, but I think it is important. And some of the videos that we've shown, the one that you're referring to, Thus Memes, was also really showing a need for mental health um, professionals to also be aware of some of the challenges that survivors are dealing with and really how can you respond in a culturally appropriate way, but also you know, thinking a lot of survivors might be going there just for some sort of sense of validation or to recognize that this happened to me. Uh, and I have these questions and there isn't a lot of training out there at this point. And it's ironic because I was, I've been emailing a couple of mental health therapists who are colleagues of mine who are really passionate about this issue and are really thinking about how can we give training to other folks. So those conversations are happening at different levels. There is a need for more education, um, not just with healthcare professionals, uh, but mental health, with social workers, all around uh, anybody who's considered a frontline professional who might come in contact with survivors or at risk group. That includes educators at school too. And so it's, uh, it's, you, you're seeing some change, but again, a lot more needs to be done to really understand how can healthcare professionals and other frontline professionals support survivors. I just want to raise as well, um, Kate has put in the chat a link to our Addressing FGC in the Clinic webinar. That's a dialogue between survivors and healthcare professionals. So if you're interested in this topic and want some further info, thank you, Kate, for, for sharing that. Yeah, thank you. I just saw it. Thanks a lot for the answer. It was very informative. I 
also wanted to use these last minutes um, to share some important information. So first, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, and thank you to you, Maria, for the questions, the answers. Um, so now if you want to also be involved and support uh, this cause and help us fight against it, um, we also created a link in order for you um, on a voluntary basis to donate um, any amount uh, you want, if you want. So I am going to share the link in the chat. Uh, if if you want to uh, support uh, financially and this um, so these donations are going to be um, transferred to to society association and therefore uh, it's going to be used to help uh, more uh, women survive um, female genital mutilation and I don't know if anyone has still some some questions I just want to say thank you very much for allowing us to give this presentation and share information about FGC. And thank you for everyone who's attended too.